Um, so the, the, the brief I was given was to talk about extension, and, and I want to start by talking about engagement. And it really comes back to the point that Justine was making. This is not a minor change. This is, uh, this is mind-blowing change in the way people think about issues. Uh, and uh, if you're going to make something work, uh, engaging with people at the start is a pretty good place. Um, and, and what we're doing uh, with a policy that creates a, a, a new property right, um, uh, and, and, to, and really to understand engagement with farmers, we have to understand the context that they're working in. And this is the context that they've been put in, a, a new property right that requires farmers to understand their farm system in a different way. Uh, it probably requires them to ditch their existing plans, and they all had plans about what they were going to do with their farms in the next 10 years, that somebody has just come in from outside and very rudely shaken up. Uh, and then, having got their heads around that, they have to plan for change. And they have to plan for change around things like profit and capital, uh, around risk and skills, and they've got to plan for it in an environment which is quite uncertain. Uh, and not just is it uncertain, but it's in the face of public pressure. So uh, when you're a farmer uh, sitting there and, uh, and, and you're reading in the local paper that you're a bad person, uh, you know, it colours your attitude towards change as well. Uh, so policy, certainty, what's going to happen to land value. So we've talked about creating new property rights that have a value. We're just transferring a value. We're transferring a value from the value of land to the value of an NDA. Uh, so let's not confuse ourselves with the idea that a new value has been created somewhere. Uh, we're confused about the right answer. If I just did one thing, if I just built a herd home, would all this go away? I mean, those are the kind of things that farmers face. You know, and, and again, in an environment where, uh, uh, where certainty is in short supply and land values are questionable and bankers are starting to wonder why the hell they ever lent you that money in the first place. Uh, so should I stay? Should I go? Should I buy? Should I sell? I mean, those are all the decisions that farmers are having to work through. And maybe there's a trading system, just to make it interesting, because uh, goodness knows none of that's interesting enough by itself. And uh, so, so, uh, so these policies are life-altering change. And uh, while I understand from Wikipedia that there's a, there's a bit of um, academic debate about whether there really are five cycles of loss, I can tell you that I've seen people in the 10 years I spent at Taupo in each of these stages, and, and talking to Mike, there are still farmers in some of those ones up the top. So there's three points I want to make out of this. This tells you we're dealing with a population of people. At different stages, uh, feeling about this in different ways, uh, different levels of expertise, uh, debt and all the other things. So we're not trying to shift the average. We've got a population of people we're dealing with. And economics is very good at thinking about the average, very good about thinking about profit debt free. Uh, it's it's very good at doing this as well if it sets out to do it. It's first point. Second point is if you're involved in this process and you haven't seen some angry farmers, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Two possibilities. One is you're dealing with an issue that's so trivial that you should be doing something else. The, the second is that you haven't engaged properly and no one knows what the hell's going on and so they're just kind of, uh, they're just sending out along the consultative people uh, and, and not actually engaging with you in a way that tells you they understand what's going on. If you haven't seen angry farmers, it's a bad sign. Uh, and you've just got to embrace that. That's just part of the journey. Uh, the third point I want to make is uh, it's easy looking from the outside to be fooled by the new entrants. So uh, you might have seen recently some big articles about a family uh, called the Olivers. Well, they've come in at acceptance. They've come from outside the catchment, bought some land court blocks, and they've slotted right in there. And they've done a whole lot of really interesting and creative things, which uh, are totally in tune with the policy. But that has involved ownership change. So if ownership change is part of what it takes to move that population, farmers are incredibly resilient, not just innovative, as Brian pointed out. And so uh, you're going to see policy implementation and this change take a long time. So that's three things to think about. So that's a bit of context, a little bit of content, Let's talk about engaging on the issue, the science, the solution, and implementation. And, and just to make the point, we have to include iteration. You've got to go around the loop a few times on this. If your solution, if, you, if your first loop around the policy solution gets you to half an irrigation scheme, you've got to go around again. Because irrigation schemes only comes in units of zero and one. So uh, you know, expect to have to go around the loop a few times. Uh, engage on the issue. Scale and intensity, so it's the sum of all farms in the catchment that's the problem. No one farm is the issue. 
And the important point that the, the MOTU team made before about good practice not being enough is almost implicit in this. If good practice is enough, you probably don't need anything very complicated. Uh, it's, it's catchment science. Kit's talked a lot about that. So evidence is required, even though we don't want to wait and do a 40-year study to find out what the right answer should be. So that whole tension about the science not being exactly what we need and how do we resolve that. And the last point I want to make here is respect local knowledge. There's a great story about this, but let me just say that this represents the debate between the locals and the lake modelers about whether the Taungariro power diversion was good or bad to the lake. Turns out they were both right. So the lessons out of that is you ignore local knowledge at your technical peril, and if you address local knowledge, you build credibility that you're actually listening and engaging, not just telling people what to do. Uh, engaging on the on-farm science. So it's really critical that everybody understands the links between farm practice and the important outcomes. And that means councillors, farmers, policy makers, uh, everybody. Because if they don't understand that, we get dumb solutions. We get dumb solutions like banning dairy farming but allowing bull beef farming. Uh, we get solutions that don't understand that if you uh, knock 20% off um, the uh, output of every farm, the average farm keeps on making a profit, but 30% of farmers go broke. Uh, and that was important information, quick and dirty as it was uh, in, in this policy. What does it require? It requires a whole bunch of expertise. Local research really helps, but you can't wait for it. Uh, and tools and models are really important to support learning, to extrapolate from what's known. And the last point I was going to make was that don't let the science get captured by one party. Science has to serve the process in this, uh, because there isn't enough science and capability for everybody to have their own experts. Just reinforce what Justine and Sandra said. Implementation, there's two parts of implementation, regulatory implementation and farm business implementation. Let's just talk about regulation first. So we've heard about setting up the initial conditions. Uh, we've got to have data, we've got to have benchmarking. Uh, we might have to have land use capability mapping. Then we have plans. Uh, we need standardised systems and tools and all the stuff about oversteer versions. Then we have auditing and compliance. So all of that takes a lot of money. It's got to be done on a one-to-one -one basis. In this particular case in Taupo, that bill's been picked up by the trust. It requires capability because you don't want <laughs> advisor, one advisor giving farmers a different answer from another advisor. You know, the credibility of this uh, is part of willing compliance, the point that Susie was making. If farmers see other people gaming the system, uh, compliance, willing compliance goes down. Farm business implementation, and this is, um, so this is about farmers understanding their farm system and how it interacts with these rights. So the first thing you've got to get your head around is a whole bunch of new measures. And of these, the hardest is dollars of profit per kilo of end leach. So Mike will tell you he runs his business now on that measure. Ten years ago, it's not a measure we even talked about. And the, and the really tricky thing, and it comes out in the land use change stuff, is that Maximising profit per kilo of end leach is not the same as maximum profit per hectare. So there's a whole lot of trading and thinking you've got to do. And to learn about that takes a big extension effort. And we put a lot of effort into farm and business modelling, case studies, local research, scenario testing, workshops with farmers and field days. For five years we ran a big program. And the sobering thing was at the end of that five years, talking about nitrogen cycling, talking about farm businesses, some people in the audience were still asking the same questions we got asked on day one. You got to move a population here and, uh, and it's a really challenging thing to do. Uh, plan A or plan B. Uh, tweaking or redesigning is, is one aspect and farmers can do that pretty much on the fly. Uh, going to forestry is a whole new skill set because uh, it's not about just stock numbers and profit. We've got to think about risk, we've got to think about capital, flexibility, and the skill sets that you need to do uh, to modify your farm business. Uh, and, and the need to invest when both farmer and banker competence is low. And uh, I really want to emphasise that, you know, that when you're shaking up the whole structure, uh, the support services start to get very nervous as well. Some tools exist to do this, but the genuine capability to use them, particularly in this different context, is very limited. It's a major concern for us in the whole dairy industry the quality of advice that people can get from external advisors to help them make these decisions just in via volatility of milk price, let alone the overlay of uh, uncertainty around policy. Plan C, uh, we're ditching plan A, 
bearing in mind that your plan might have been to sell anyway and now you can't for a decade while you just wait this out. Uh, do you buy, do you sell? And you know, here's the first time we mentioned trading NDAs. So in all the things the farmers have had to get their head around, now you know, trading NDAs actually is a pretty small part of the deal. Uh, you might redesign your business and Mike will talk about that. So again, we're into a whole wider set of expertise needed by farmers and their advisors. Uh, how much time does it take? 12 years on, 12 years on, 70% of farmers have resource consent, so one third don't. Rotorua, 10 to 12 years on, how far are we away from actually having a solution? And this is totally unacceptable. The uncertainty that people in these catchments have to live with in this time and all the anger and denial and cycling that goes on is not good enough. We've got to find better ways. Um, and that's just to get the, uh, the policy in place. How much time do people need to adapt? How much time does certainly need to flow, flow through? How much time to change those systems uh, and, and build the skills? So three conclusions I want to make. First of all, genuine well-resourced farmer engagement is critical to good policy well before you make any decision on trading. Uh, extension or education about what a trading scheme is is a small part of what's required for any policy. So we need credible local information, individual analysis, expertise, tools and systems. And really just to make the final point again, the time and capability required to make these changes in a way that farmers uh, will, will support farmer viability and profitability and willing compliance uh, is, a, is a huge ask and you should never underestimate it. Okay.